The following is a local resident producer's program. The program content is the sole responsibility of the producer and does not necessarily reflect the views or policies of CATV2, Oshkosh Community Media Services, the City of Oshkosh, or Time Warner Cable. <coughs> Hi everybody, welcome to Ayan Oshkosh, Cheryl Hens here, and uh, we're very pleased to be welcoming two first-timers to our show tonight, uh, and they're going to be talking about uh, kind of an exciting program that's being started for, uh, uh, I think, primarily youth in the area, but I don't know that much about it, and I'm going to learn along with you folks tonight. So anyway, to my left is Wendy Falk. Wendy is a uh, teacher, she's an English teacher with the Oshkosh Area School District. We're going to find out how she came to get involved in this program as an English teacher. Um, and Shauna Coleman is to my right. Shauna is the Aquatics Director at the Oshkosh Area YMCA. So, ladies, thanks to both of you for being here. We appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm sure you have better things to do on a Thursday night, but this is important. <laughs> so, um, this is a new adaptive sports program in our community. It's... Um, and the name of your group is the Oshkosh Special Needs Parent Coalition. Correct. Okay. So, um, and we're going to be putting your website address up throughout the um, throughout this particular segment. But what is Oshkosh Special Needs Parent Coalition? It started out as a group of just a couple of parents who have children with special needs in the area. And they started to realize that regardless of what types of special needs their children had, a lot of times parents have similar needs. Um, th sometimes they need resources, sometimes they need advocates. And so the group was formed to help ensure that parents of children with special needs in the Oshkosh area had access to those things. Okay. Now when we talk about special needs, you're right, there's all kinds of special needs. Are Absolutely. we talking uh, primarily cognitive and physical needs, special needs here where they're handicapped? Primarily uh, disabilities. That could be something as um, mild as having a learning disability. It could be something as severe as having a child um, who's completely uh, set up in a wheelchair, you know, can't physically move or anything. It could be cognitive disabilities, it could be developmental disabilities like autism. Okay, all right. And boy, autism, we're, we're, I mean, we keep hearing so much about autism these days. Yes, we do. So, okay, so you formed this group, and as I understand it, it's, it's really a relatively new thing, just maybe five, six months old? Yes, it is. It was formed uh, this spring, and I think the first meetings happened in April and May. Okay. Um, I brought, came into the group as I have three children, two of them do have autism. And, and that's how an English teacher came to get involved in And that's how an English this. teacher came okay. in. And um, I had some good friends who also have children with special needs that were part of forming the group. They brought me in, and it's been a really wonderful experience to network with these parents and have other people who really understand where you're coming from, what your life is like on a daily basis. Um, but those people also know how to share the joys of that type of parenthood as well. Sure. So what's the real mission here? Um, and, and what ages are we talking about? And, and I'm not, we'll bring you in here when Absolutely. we get to the, the section of, about the <laughs> YMCA, but um, what, I mean, because certainly we've got adults in the community yes, we who do. have special needs as well. Yes, we do. Is this open to just specific age groups or? It can really be anyone. Okay. And, and we invite whatever participants we can get in the area, regardless of whatever type of disability that might be. Um, but ultimately, our goal, as we started to get together as parents, what we found out is that a lot of people wanted more consistent adaptive recreation options in the area. You know, there were very inconsistent options. Sometimes there might be some swimming lessons here. Sometimes there might be an adaptive soccer program there. And okay. those were great things and we love them, but there's nothing really consistent. And so I was sort of charged with the task to find a way to get a consistent, comprehensive recreational program in the area um, 
adaptively speaking, um, even that might include something like eventually down the road some drama or other things because, you know, our kids aren't just about sports either right. as right. many other right. children are. Um, so that's when I thought, oh my gosh, uh, what's an organization in our community that has wonderful resources? Um, I've always had excellent experiences bringing my special needs children uh, there. Uh, and I immediately thought of the YMCA. Mm -hmm. And so I contacted um, Shauna and also um, some other members at the YMCA to approach them about, is this something that was possible? And they came on board very excited, um, in fact, saying that was something they'd already been discussing, okay. uh, creating. So it was just a natural partnership between sure, our group absolutely. and theirs. Um, we're able to provide them with the some ideas of what we were looking for and also some help because as much as maybe they don't know everything they need to know about various disabilities, they're so open and willing to learn and, and we as parents, I know, really value that sure. uh, kind of partnership and interest in each other. Sure. So it's been great. Well, kudos to the YMCA for, for stepping up and for actually having a vision about this You know, before you guys uh, kind of mm -hmm. came together. <coughs> what what was prompting you all at the YMCA to um, think along these lines? Mm -hmm. We just saw it as a, we're always looking for ways to fill the need in our community. And certainly um, having a special needs program or some kind of special needs programming is a need in our community. Yeah. We know we have, you know, special needs children who come through and they might mainstream into our, you know, our pro the current programs, but we knew we needed something different to try to attract more of those children and people and help them, you know, have a have a place where they can feel comfortable and, you know, get the same access to sports and sports equipment and things that um, every other child has in the community. So, we had already been thinking along those lines. It's hard to um, recruit and know how to how to you know bring those people out of the woodwork and bring mm -hmm. them in the doors. So sure. it was great to um, hear from Wendy. We were thrilled to talk to her and we had a great meeting. Our first meeting was was yeah. great. A lot of ideas, you know, floating mm -hmm. around, which was really exciting for us sure. too. So. When, I mean, are there structured times when these kinds of events go on, um, or is it just sort of at will, you know, the group can come in whenever? Well, right now, what we wanted to do is, like I said, one of the things we were looking for is a consistent program. Mm -hmm. So the YMCA publishes their program guide, which I believe you have even mm -hmm. with you, Shauna. I do. Um, but they publish their program guide that says, this session, these are all the activities we're offering. And as you would take for granted that there are soccer options or football or any other things in there, we wanted to eventually have it so that there's a, a section of here's what's being offered for adaptive recreation mm -hmm. consistently so that the way any other child can enroll in a program, so too can a child with special needs have the same avail availability to programming sure. uh, that works for them. So right now, this first session, uh, we wanted to start out with the um, adaptive swim. That was the biggest thing that our parents were looking for. Mm -hmm. um, water is just a wonderful therapeutic tool for kids with special needs and so the first thing that most parents asked for was a, um, a, an adaptive aquatics program and uh, that's, J Shauna jumped right on that and it was really wonderful uh, what she came up with. Well and so when they have this swim program mm -hmm. um, you know, it's been a lot of years since I've done anything at the Y, um, you know, but I know when I would go down there, you've got things like open swim, but then you have other things that, uh, like the pool area is closed to other groups. And I'm mm -hmm. assuming that that's how this is, is going to be structured, right? I mean, whatever the kids and or adults are working on, whatever sporting equipment they're using, whatever area of the YMCA they're, they're using, it's going to be closed to other people. It will be for their use. The pool, we hardly ever close the pool for any, <laughs> to other yeah. to members or any other mm -hmm. for a, any reason, um, except for swim meets. But um, we will we we chose a quieter time on Saturdays to okay. do these lessons. Um, we know that noise can be a factor for for some special needs students, so we chose an 11:30 time in, um, in the morning on Saturdays, and that's typically a very quiet time. Lap mm -hmm. summers have come and gone, and all the other lessons yeah. are done. So that will be the only those will be the only lessons going on. Um, we haven't quite got our noon lap summers in yet, so mm -hmm. um, we kind of picked that time as a really quiet time. The family pool isn't as busy, so we should have good, you know, relatively quiet pool time for that. Because I would think that would be real important, because let's face it, I mean, not everyone in, in our society, not just Oshkosh, but our society <laughs> as, a, as a whole, um, I mean, people can sometimes be pretty cruel. And, you know, the last thing that I would think anyone would want to do is subject these, these individuals to 
ridicule or anything like that. Um, and plus, you don't want to make them feel uncomfortable either. No, you don't. You know? um, I don't think we want to, we certainly don't want to put other people in a position where they feel uncomfortable, they mm -hmm. don't know what to do or say. But I think a lot of that happens because they have limited experience yeah. mm -hmm. with those individuals. Oh, and it's hard for, it is hard for my child to, to understand how to interact with others. Um, and on one hand, I want him to gain more experience trying to interact with others, but at the same time, I'm aware of the fact that he's going to have to, unfortunately, deal with some intolerance from mm -hmm. people. That's going to happen. Um, but it's going to happen at a time where I can be there. Yeah. I can be his voice. I can be his advocate. And I can do it in a way that protects my son, but at the same time, hopefully, educates that individual just a little bit more. And sure. I think, you know, that's that's the important part. Of, that's part of the, the parent role mm -hmm. in this program is that we need to be there for the education, for the support for, our, you know, the advocate for our child when they can't be one for themselves. And also for the, for the why. I mean, we're so grateful to them for jumping in on this with us that, you know, anything we can do to support them and their environment and help other patrons understand our children better, mm -hmm. we should be doing that. We should make every effort. Okay. So the adaptive swim uh, component of this overall um, coalition or program, um, that is getting underway when? We're starting that um, Saturday, September 19th. September 19th. And it will okay. be a six week, that will be a six week session. So they'll come once a week for six weeks, 45 minutes each time. Okay. We're offering both group and private. Um, lessons within that structure so um, we can have a group of three that would be the maximum and then also you know students who need one-on-one -on -one individual attention we have that offering as well at okay. the same time and these are just basic swimming lessons swim lessons a little um, water therapy you okay. know some some of the students will you know will benefit greatly from just walking in the water using some of the equipment to kick and mm -hmm. you know move their arms mobility wise so um, it's a little bit of therapy and a little bit of swim lessons at the same time. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. Is there a charge for this, or is this just something that you guys are, are graciously donating? Mm -hmm. There is a charge. Um, okay. We have a member and non-member rate, just like any other swim lesson. Um, however, we do provide scholarships for anyone who needs it at okay. any time. They just, with a phone now, call. Now, what do you mean scholarships? What are the, is, is there like a big, long application process they have to go through, or what's involved in no, that? No, they call me and say, you know what, we just can't do the 28, and they say, I can do five. And I say, great, let's do it. Okay, all right. We, have, we so raise money every year to support that. So, so people should not let a financial hardship necessarily be a roadblock. Absolutely not. Okay. Absolutely not for any of our programs at the Y, but particularly this one as well. Okay, right. all right. So, so the swim is, is just one component of it. And again, um, for, for viewers at home, uh, it starts uh, Saturday, September 19th for six weeks, and it's always on a Saturday. So right. at 11.30 a.m. 11.30 to 12.15. 11.30 mm -hmm. to 12.15. Yep. All right. Now, I should point out, too, that while the swimming was the first and most important component that our parents had wanted, we did also want, like I said, a comprehensive program. And so we had talked about um, seeing how this goes, uh, how we're able to get things up and running. And on our side, we're trying to market and help uh, get some awareness about this program out in the community. But we also talked about then, it, depending on the success of it, uh, down the road, maybe we'd offer a sports for all sorts sort of thing. Um, you know, Cute maybe name. one week <laughs> where, one week we might do basketball, one week there might be football, yeah. you know, just a, and watch the program going from there so that, you know, certainly we can't expect everything all at once, but we can try to uh, grow into that and add to the program as it continues to develop and, and gains awareness in the community. So I think we should watch for that to continue because I think it's going to be wonderful to see um, how this partnership works out. Sure. That how Did you actually come up with the idea, Wendy, or, or was this... Um, a bunch of parents kind of just brainstorming one day. Parents were just kind of out there one day at this meeting um, talking about how they would just like more, they were talking about all the things that they'd like to see happen in the community and the kinds of things that they'd like to see the coalition work for. Mm -hmm. And one of the things they wanted to see happen was more adaptive recreation. And I had some specific ideas about that, particularly about the why, and so it was kind of like, hey, well, Wendy, Go for it. <laughs> Have a good time. And, you know, that's great because 
if I can be of help and service to other families that way, then I welcome that. Um, but, and, and it helps my own children too. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I, I had developed a few contacts within the YMCA and um, was happy to, to jump on that right away and, and put those to use. But like I said, I, I had never expected it initially that we'd be able to get things up and running so quickly and yeah. that's really to the wise credit. I'm very grateful for that. Sure, sure. Uh, um, is, has there ever been anything like this in the Oshkosh area that you're aware of? I know that there have been uh, some things that come up, but like I said, I think they're more intermittent. Yeah. Um, I know kind that the rec department, sort of thing. you know, and, and they're wonderful offerings. I mean, I, I certainly don't mean to downgrade anything anybody else has done yeah. because I'm so grateful for those things. Um, but I don't think anything's ever been offered with the same consistency mm -hmm. that it's predictable. Um, you know, with the YMCA, you know there's always going to be a new session, a new program mm -hmm. guide, new offerings. And that kind of comes up. Plus, they have um, the financial and staffing resources to back that up sure. on a consistent basis. Consistency and, and longevity, mm -hmm. too. Correct. You right. know, I mean, mm -hmm. there's nothing more frustrating than to think you're going to start something and, and you go maybe one or two times and there's not enough interest and so it sort of falls by the wayside. But certainly, participation in this is, is yes. you know, key to okay. its success. How many folks are involved in this so far and is it enough, is it sufficient enough to make this a success? I think we started out with what, 15 or 18 slots? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. And I don't have access to the YMCA's records to know uh, where that's at right now with registration. Um, but I know that when I shared the information with the group, it was received uh, very openly. They were excited. Uh, lots of smiles in the room. They were just absolutely thrilled that oh my gosh, my child will finally be able to do these things. Um, because not only when I went to Shauna and some of the other staff members, not only did I say to them, okay, we want adaptive swim, we want this, we want that. But I also said, you know, we'd really love it if you had it on Saturdays because it makes our lives so much easier. And that's part of where that <laughs> Saturday time came from. And boy, you know, parents were just as thrilled with their willing to accommodate. Um, as, as much as anything else. And to Wendy's credit, you know, there are things that we just didn't know. I mean, I don't have a special needs child, so I didn't know that they have therapy after school and then, and then all these other things going on that, oh yeah, I guess a four o'clock time slot isn't gonna work, you know, <laughs> on a Wednesday. So, you know, it was, it was all the information we've gotten from Wendy has been invaluable to us to help us, you know, create a program that's gonna work because mm -hmm. she said, oh yeah, Saturday is the day that we have open. Great, you know, mm -hmm. let's do it. Yeah. And um, you know, just everything from, we're also gonna set up a special needs family night at the Y. Okay. So the families can come and see the environment, try out the pool, go through the locker room situation, see how that's gonna work so they can basically test, try out the YMCA before they come and, and make sure they know, you know, where they're going. And, you know, it helps with um, a lot of special needs children to be able to see the environment they're gonna be in first sure. and be acquainted with it before they actually jump in for those first, the first day of lessons. So. Sure. Now, Wendy, I know you've talked about um, having other aspects of this program. Yeah. Yes. you know, beyond the swim part. Are those things that you will start, um, will they run simultaneous or, or concurrent here with they the adaptive swim? They would be things we would add. You know, it wouldn't be in place of. They would be things that we would add so that hopefully over time, you know, this grows into a, a comprehensive program that you have multiple adaptive offerings at any one okay. time. So it's not like the swim's going to end and then, you know, no. something else is going to start. No. They will run at the same time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, all right. And that's, well, a, and that's yeah. a good thing. And we're just looking to slowly roll things out, you know, because, uh, you know, we can get all excited, but we really do need to drum up support for this. That's a big part of our role. But then also, um, you know, I think that the YMCA, to their credit, really wants to do it, um, do justice to the program, make sure that right. yeah. people, not only that our families are comfortable, but that also that their employees are comfortable, that they feel prepared, mm -hmm. because um, they're very open to working with our children, but they might feel hesitant, because maybe I've never worked with a kid with autism before, and, or, or Down syndrome, or, or cerebral palsy, or I don't know what's the best way to, to work with this child? And, and they need time to learn that. They need, and again, that's part of our role too as parents then to help the YMCA staff feel more comfortable with our children, understand them better so mm -hmm. that they can have a great working relationship. And so right. if you have someone then who is um, not a child, 
Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're an older adult person, um, you know, but yet they do have special needs. Who would contact you then about this? Would it be like their, their guardian or, mm -hmm. uh, or their caretaker? I mean, how, how does this work? Mm -hmm. Well, as far as our group goes, as far as the coalition goes, you know, we're a coalition of parents meeting together, and we do have a number of parents of adults with special needs. Okay. Um, right. So the, their older parents are there as part of the group, and that's great. And those parents would then take the responsibility. Okay. Um, Sometimes, you know, they, they often have guardians. Maybe it's a person, um, maybe that adult is living in a group home situation, and there's somebody that checks in on them daily that can help them make that connection. Um, it, I don't think it has to necessarily be a guardian that signs mm -hmm. them up. I Just could be wrong about that, but somebody yeah, well-connected right, with that person. Right, right that can authorize them to participate and, 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 and get them going. But we, we certainly invite, there's, there's opportunities for everybody at any age. Okay, excellent. Now, you were kind enough to, uh, to print out this little sheet here. <laughs> I didn't have a great deal of time to look at this before, okay. we, uh, before we started uh, taping tonight. Um, but one thing, and I think we've probably been putting this up uh, throughout the, uh, the time that we've been chatting, uh, but in case you've missed it, um, the website is www.osn as in Nancy pc.org osnnpc.org and um, like most websites I'm assuming it's probably a work in progress it is a work in progress but they do have a number of things up there um, sometimes we put um, individual family stories Okay. that we you, people might find inspirational. I know that they put on there the Oshkosh Area School District Board of Education meetings and encourage parents to come and tell their story so that we can make sure that the Board of Education understands what children with special needs need from the school district. Okay. Uh, because certainly that's, that's one of our priorities too is ensuring that our children are advocated well for in their education. Sure. Is this affiliated at all with the Oshkosh Area School District or is it something totally separate? It's entirely separate, okay. but certainly uh, most of the parents do have a lot of experience in working with the district um, and a lot of connections and so we try to continue developing a, a really positive working relationship so that when there's issues arising in a child's education we can deal with those promptly. Okay. Your mission statement. Um, you've got a mission statement and a vision statement, and honestly, I've never known what the difference is. Uh, but <laughs> your, your mission statement is a unified voice for those with special needs. That's pretty straightforward. The yeah. vision statement is a little bit expanded, and it is our vision is to support families, educate the community, and advocate for the values and rights of these special people. And then you talk about the values, and maybe in our time remaining, we can talk about some of those values. Sure. Um, you know, uh, why don't you run down the list here of what some of those values <laughs> are? I'll hand that back to you. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I don't have these memorized. Um, but basically, we do want to encourage respect for all individuals. Um, many times people talk about tolerance of diversity, and I do include individuals with disabilities as, as one aspect of diversity, mm -hmm. but tolerance is really a negative word mm -hmm. when you think about it, because it means I, I merely am tolerating your presence, and that's not really what we want. Um, you don't have to like me, you don't, but I, I would expect you to respect me, and I would expect you to respect my child. You don't have to like him, but you do need to treat him like a human being, and so um, respect is, is pretty basic on that. We try to be proactive in that we focus on solutions so that rather than constantly complaining about repeatedly this is the problem and obsessing over what's always going wrong, we try to change our mindset and get to how can we make this better? What can we do now? You know, that's in past, but where are we going to go from here? And you know, that's part of where this led us to is going to the YMCA because they are really are part of the solution. Um, and of course, increasing community awareness um, and being flexible with the needs of our group, the way we need to be flexible for the needs of our children, so too does our group need to be flexible uh, so that everyone feels included, everyone feels valued, and also everybody gets what they need mm -hmm. from the group. And that means because we all have very diverse needs, we're going to have to be willing to roll with the punches so that we can address those needs appropriately. Okay. 
So I think that pretty much sums it up. All right, excellent. <laughs> now, how often do you meet? We meet usually monthly. Okay. Um, and the schedule is on the website uh, that people can check that out. The next meeting is going to be September 12th. It's from 1 to 3. Um, and the meetings are typically held in the Hooper Building on 36 Broad Street here in Oshkosh. And we do offer child care, too. So oh, okay. um, we, if, depending on how many people might be coming, um, we will then make sure we have enough babysitters available, babysitters who are adept in working with individuals with disabilities, um, so that you can come and feel free to participate without mm -hmm. worrying about obtaining extra care for your child. And of course, there is no cost for the meetings or the child care. Okay. Just come and participate. That's the best thing. Okay. And if they go to the website, is there yes. a contact number on the website, Wendy, as far as? Yes. Um, our contact person is Shannon Walter, and her phone number is 233-1858. It's on the website. And also, her email address is there, too. So contacting her via email or by phone and just mentioning that you got this information through the Special Needs Parent Coalition website, um, and she will be happy to uh, direct you from there. She is the contact person also if you would like child care for the meetings. Okay, all right. So again, her name is Shannon, and it is on the contact info, yes, phone number, and email on the is website. on the website. Yes, it is. But her number, um, just in case you're jotting this down at home, um, or you want to jot it down at home, is 233-1858, you said? Correct. Okay. I did that pretty fast from yes, memory, just did. jotting that down. <laughs> okay. So the next meeting you said is coming up when? September 14th. Okay. Or, excuse me, I'm sorry, the Saturday, September 12th, and it's from 1 to 3. And we're going to be talking to the ARC of Winnebago County, looking at how we can connect with them and try to uh, network services for families um, by partnering with them as well. Okay. All right. I and so are the meetings always two hours? Typically two okay. hours, and it does allow for a little time for socialization and things. There's sure. always refreshments available. Um, but they, we typically do have some goals to to accomplish, but it's a great way to network and meet with parents just to get out and meet other people to know you're not alone. Sometimes you feel your own house becomes your island. Um, we don't want families to ha feel like that's the way things have to be. Okay. All right. Excellent. Well, very good. Any closing thoughts for us in like our last 30 seconds? <laughs> if you don't have any, that's fine. There's no I'm pressure. I'm fine, but I have to say again, thank you so much for to the YMCA yes. because they really are making some dreams come true for families in Oshkosh, and that's a wonderful thing. Okay, excellent. Well, so folks should contact, uh, and can they also contact you if they... Absolutely. Okay. So sure. you can contact uh, Shannon at 233-1858. You can contact Shauna. Shannon, Shauna, <laughs> Shauna at the YMCA. Uh, go to the website, and again, I don't have this memorized, so I'm going to steal this back from you. Um, www.osnpc.org. Ladies, thank you so much for being here. Thank it, you. It was a real pleasure. Thank you. I enjoyed hearing thank about you. it. Thank you. And uh, keep us posted on how things go. I certainly will. Right. Well. Sit tight, and uh, we're going to take a short break. When we come back, we'll be joined by the Executive Director of FAIR Wisconsin. We'll be right back. Dear Mom and Dad, well, I finally have some time off, so I'm writing to tell you that I'm doing well. We have good days and bad days over here. We try to remember the good ones and get through the bad ones. Mostly we have each other, and that's what keeps us going. And Mom, since you asked, if anyone wants to help, just tell them to contact the USO. You can't believe how much they do for us. With love, your son, Michael. Every year, the U.S. Department of the Treasury receives about 1.4 million reports of problems with paper checks. Checks can be lost, stolen, or delayed. If you still receive Social Security payments by paper check, Treasury wants you to know about a safer, more convenient way to get your money. The Direct Express Prepaid Debit MasterCard. The Direct Express card is new and is available to anyone receiving Social Security benefits, even if you don't have a bank account. Your monthly benefits will be automatically placed onto your card account each month on the day your money is due. While other debit cards cost money, it is possible to use the Direct Express card for free to make purchases, pay bills, and get cash at thousands of locations nationwide. There are no sign-up or monthly account fees. No more waiting for the mail or worrying about lost or stolen checks. Call 1-877-212-9991 or visit www.usdirectexpress.com. 
we were in an emergency situation. We don't have extra. We have a little bit of water and a little bit of food. A meeting no. place, no. No. I don't think we have a first aid kit. We have tuna fish, we have right. beans, we tuna. have um, um, canned beans. tomatoes, true. you know. That's true, but uh, that's really not survival food. Tomato we, paste. Yeah, well, oh. yeah. Right? All right. Very pleased to be joined now by uh, Katie Bellinger. She is the executive director, as I mentioned before the break, of Fair Wisconsin. Um, and uh, you're here from Madison, so we appreciate you're making the drive tonight. Thank to, you. To I'm here. happy to be here. Um, the main thing we wanted to talk about, of course, is the, um, the uh, domestic partnership um, that has gone into effect. Mm -hmm. It became legal um, with the signing of the biennium budget uh, just a few weeks ago, um, sometime in July. And um, as of August 1st, it became legal for same-sex couples in the state of Wisconsin to get registered as domestic partners. And, um, you know, this, this is a pretty significant thing because basically it gives same-sex couples some of the rights, albeit very few in mm -hmm. comparison to what married couples have, um, but it does give some of the basic rights that everybody should have. Right. Right? So, Absolutely. So anyway, um, you know, I, I guess one of the first places I want to start is I, I've been reading on some of the blogs about how, um, you know, now heterosexual couples who are just living together, now they're being discriminated against. And I don't know that it's so much heterosexual couples themselves who are cohabitating who are saying this, but I think that that's what some of the folks in the community are saying. And I, I guess the reason why they weren't included in this legislation is because they have the ability to get married, right? Well, yes. I mean, the, the intention of the law was to be able to provide protections to couples who don't have an avenue to get these protections. Um, and we talked with Governor Doyle about that quite extensively when, when we were working on developing the legislation and talking about whether or not um, it would go in the budget and, and how it would look. And, and he felt very strongly that you know, for pure law, we should be addressing the real problem. And mm -hmm. the real problem is that caring and committed same-sex couples don't have an avenue to get some of the most basic protections they need. Right. Now this, um, you were kind enough to bring me this uh, domestic partnership protections reference guide because of course I had printed this off last night in preparation for this and um, things were a little crazy in my house before I came over here today and I left all the stuff sitting <laughs> on my desk. <laughs> so I thank you for doing this. But what are some of the, um, what are some of the rights that are guaranteed now with this? Sure. Um, these are things like hospital visitation and end-of-life decision-making, the ability to take leave to care for a sick or injured partner, inheritance and survivor protections, um, you know, some of, some of just the most critical things. Mm -hmm. um, those, are, those are really the big ones. We're talking about roughly 43 different protections of the over 200 provided to married couples under state law yeah. and none of the federal benefits of marriage. Right. Well, and, and I know a couple others are, um, um, if, if you want to have your partner get your house or uh, say, say you've got your home titled just in your name, mm -hmm. you want to add your partner's name to it. In the past, you had to, you couldn't just do a quit claim deed, you couldn't just add them on, you had to actually pay, and it was an odd amount too, it, it could be very expensive, like over a hundred dollars, you'd have to go through all these steps to get that person's name added onto the title and deed. Now it can be done through a quit claim deed because right. of this. Right, the joint tenancy is included. It's not the same as marital property rights. Right. Um, so that's one thing to be very clear about, just to make sure that couples who are registering understand that, that that's not the case. Um, but yes, joint tenancy is included as well. And also, you can't be forced to testify against your partner in a court of law, yes. I, <laughs> which I think that's a good thing. And I, I read um, that uh, a lawyer um, actually said, you know, because she's had to go through all kinds of hoops mm -hmm. in preparing clients uh, for things. And, and so she was uh, very happy with, with that aspect of this as well. 
Um, one of the other things that I <laughs> that I left at home with all my other paperwork is, of course, uh, Julaine. And I don't, am I pronouncing her first name right? Julaine. Julaine. Yeah, mm -hmm. Julaine Appling. Um, and because I don't have my notes, um, I also don't know the group that she's with. But she was very opposed to the. Um, marriage amendment uh, that, well, she was in favor of the marriage amendment banning yes. same-sex marriage. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a referendum thing, and you can always twist these referendums oh, in yes. different ways. It, it gets a little confusing. But she wanted marriage in the state of Wisconsin to be defined as one man, one woman, nothing else. And that is what they pushed for. But she was saying back then that inheritance things and, you know, stuff like that, if, if that's what same-sex couples wanted, that was fine, she didn't have an issue with that. Now, of course, with the passage of the biennium budget, and this included in the biennium budget, now she and her group have filed a lawsuit. Yes. And I thought it was very interesting, a couple weeks ago we had on Scott Ross from mm -hmm. One Wisconsin Now, and um, you know he and he's got a press release out and it's on his website too and I'm sure you've seen it mm -hmm. you know was she lying then or was she lying now because you can't have it both ways and so what is fair Wisconsin's um, feeling about her about face if you will well I think that it's it's certainly interesting to all of us because during the amendment uh, struggle in 2006 fair Wisconsin was leading the fight against this amendment that like you said defines marriage between a man and a woman but also uh, prohibits anything that's substantially similar to marriage and we said well what does that mean when we're talking about substantially mm -hmm. similar and you know we raised the red flag about does this mean domestic partnerships and you know Julaine and Senator Scott Fitzgerald, who was the lead sponsor in the Senate, uh, were very clear that this does not limit domestic partnerships. So fast forward three years, <laughs> we're trying to put together domestic partnerships and get some of just the most basic protections put together. And um, from the outset, they said that they were going to cha challenge this legally. And so I think it becomes very clear what the true intentions were and what the true intentions were with the marriage amendment in 2006 and what their true intentions are now. And it's not about, uh, it's not about domestic partnerships. It's about um, you know, their view of the lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender community. And, and I think that people need to be very aware of, of the about face that we've mm -hmm. seen. And we're gonna be working very hard to make sure that everyone is aware of that, um, that discrepancy. Well, and you know, it really kind of flies, I mean, it's hypocrisy through and through, especially since so many, I mean, the, the majority of, of voters in Wisconsin, even though they said, okay, marriage, one man, one woman, they've still also said, hey, we don't have a big problem with domestic right. partnership, civil union type situations. We just don't want it to be marriage. And so she's kind of going against what the majority of voters have somewhat said over the years as well. Well, yes, um, voters, voters, uh, you know, overwhelmingly voted for this amendment in 2006. Mm -hmm. But what we've seen in our research since then, and what we've seen when we've gone around the state talking to uh, couples, talking to people, talking to legislators from around the state, uh, they understand that domestic partnerships are not marriage. And they understand that this is just, this is about the government not standing in the way of two people trying to take care of each other and live their lives mm -hmm. and have a little bit of protection every day and a little bit more respect and dignity. And, and that has been very clear with how non-controversial this whole process has been with domestic partnerships. Um, it's a really common sense, um, practical way to address this issue and 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 I think you're absolutely right that people agree on this that this is not this is this is not a problem this is the right step for our state yeah well and, and you know it, she's almost laugh well not almost she is laughable <laughs> because you know she she wants to protect the sanctity of marriage and that's all fine and well but how is anyone's sexuality affecting her view of marriage or her own marriage for that matter if if she's married it's it's not so what is the issue here it, it just seems to me like you know you've got so many heterosexual people running around having affairs look at look at the lawmakers that we've seen 
just in the last six to nine months alone, running around having affairs with this person, that person. And, um, you know, that I think is more of a threat against the sanctity and the institution of marriage than two same-sex persons who love each other and mm -hmm. are in a committed relationship. Right, and who just want to visit each other in the hospital. And who just or have some it. other rights as well. Right, <laughs> right, know? or just, you know, you they're, know. they're just, they're, they're like every other couple who are living day in and day out, trying to make ends meet, trying to, you know, find a, find a place that they can call their home and go about their business. And actually paying more in taxes than a married couple because you don't have the same tax benefits and you can't file joint tax returns. Right. And that's so. also still not included in domestic partnerships. Right. Yep. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so this lawsuit is, is filed. It obviously, you know, didn't stop couples from registering. No. Um, by the way, do you know offhand how many couples have registered across the state so far? I don't know the exact number. Um, total around the state. I know that today Dane County got up to 200 couples okay. and I believe that today in Winnebago County um, I talked with a couple who registered today and they were number 46. Okay. So it really varies around the state but I think it it varies just like you would expect it to vary based mm -hmm. on population and sure and um, and you know different demographic factors. Well, yeah, I mean, of the 72 counties that we've got, some are very small and, right. and pretty rural, right. and then you've got some that are more metropolitan and, and urban-like. Mm -hmm. um, but do you have some sense, and this one's gonna be even harder, I'm sorry, <laughs> because there's so many people who are not public about their relationships, but do you have right. some sense of how many same-sex couples in the state this has the potential to affect Sure. Actually, I do have the answer to that question. All right. Um, it wasn't as tough as I thought. <laughs> <laughs> well, in, in developing and, and lobbying on the legislation, we did a lot of work with um, the UCLA School of Law. They have a, okay. an institute, the Williams Institute, that does research specifically on LGBT issues. And they've done research in, in all different states um, to help support some of the legislation that's been moving forward. Mm -hmm. um, so we worked closely with them to, to get some of those facts and figures together. Based on the 2000 census data and their um, calculations that I don't pretend to understand as I'm it's not difficult. A, math, <laughs> a mathematician <laughs> myself, but their, their calculations estimate that there are roughly 15,000 same-sex couples in Wisconsin. Okay. And they predict, based on um, the type of legislation we have, the level of protection, um, and the process for registering, that in the first year alone, anywhere between 1,200 and 5,000 couples would be registering around the state. And that's the first year. So okay. uh, we'll, we'll see where we end up. There was certainly a, a bit of a rush on the first day for couples who wanted to be the first in line. Yeah. Um, we were outside of the Dane County uh, Clerk's Office at 5 in the morning on August 3rd with the first couples there to register. And were so they lined up waiting? We had about five couples at 5 really? in the morning, but there was wow. a good line most of the day. Um, we registered 50 couples that day just in Dane County, um, which was quite a workload for them. But they, they were fantastic. They were really great to work with. So. And, um, you know, we don't need to, uh, unless you want to, go through the things that, that people need to do to register. Uh, but if, if people are interested, it's, it's on the Fair Wisconsin website. And I think we've probably been putting that up, but it's fairwisconsin.com. Dot com, right? Yes, dot com. Yeah. I always get confused on, on organizations mm -hmm. that are nonprofit. Dot com, dot org. Sure. So anyway, fairwisconsin.com. Um, and you guys just have a, a plethora of information there. Mm -hmm. um, in, in, in fact, when I was doing some research for this show, uh, you actually had a link to the, the legislation itself. Yes. I mean, it was really long <laughs> and a lot of legal. I know, ways, I've read it. <laughs> but it, it, it um, I read part of it and then I thought, oh, my head, my head. Mm -hmm. But um, it's, it's there for someone who wants to see Absolutely. it. Absolutely. We have a lot of resources from, you know, the legislation itself to different websites about if you're looking at um, how getting, as a state employee, health insurance affects your taxes. We have links for that on our website as well as our, our four-page reference guide about how to register um, and we're also happy to answer any questions 
questions. So if you go to our website, our contact information is there. Give us a call. Send us an email. We're happy to we're happy to help. Okay, you know, a, a question that um, a, a friend of mine had asked me to ask when um, I said that you were going to be on the show. Um, she is a county employee in mm -hmm. in another county, and her partner moved here. I don't know, uh, maybe four years ago, uh, from another state, and. I believe retired from her job. Mm -hmm. I mean, she's not of retirement age, but she had had enough time uh, accrued at that job, I believe. In any event, she has some insurance, but I guess it's not very good. Mm -hmm. And so her partner was saying, well, if I want, you know, my county to be able to offer, um, you know, health benefits to domestic partners as the state employees can get. Um, how do they go about that? Do they do they have to approach their union about that, or is that something that would, I would assume it would have to be approved by the county board in whatever county, would it not? Well, if she's a union member, um, the first step should probably be talking to her union to talk about how to get that into their bargaining agreement and the negotiations. And That's, if she's not a union if member? If she's not a union member, then she would have to work through the county government itself to get okay. that change. Now, she'd have to take a look at where the county would buy their health insurance policy from. Mm -hmm. Many units of local government actually buy into the state health care system. So with the state changing how they provide health care coverage to domestic partners of um, same and opposite sex uh, domestic or same and opposite sex employees, um, it, it might be a, a permissive change that a, a local government could elect to start doing that. But it, so that might be a little easier. But then. the government would have the the local unit would have to. Um, decide that they wanted to provide those benefits. And then it would probably have to go before the county board or? Most likely. How I, yeah. I'm not familiar with um, how every county operates in terms of their health care coverage. So, okay. but, uh, but yeah, I would definitely, if she's non-represented, um, start talking with their HR department. I, I think uh, she's, she's in a supervisory position and therefore I don't think she's unionized, okay. so she probably is non-represented, but I'm not 100% certain. But mm -hmm. at least that gives uh, me some good information in case she misses the show. Sure. Um, lawsuits are always hard to predict mm -hmm. how they're going to go. But if you had a crystal ball sitting here, Katie, and you could gaze into it, how, how would you feel this is going to go? I feel very confident right now. I feel very confident about the challenge to domestic partnerships. Uh, we are not talking about marriage. We're talking about a very small set of protections. Um, and, and that is not, that is not marriage. Um, and, and, you know, we have legal opinions from our attorneys. We have legal opinions from the attorneys that represent the legislature. Mm -hmm. They issued a memo in May saying, um, as the legislature was considering the, the domestic partnership provision, saying that this is not substantially similar to marriage. This does not rise to the level of substantially similar. So we've got a lot going for us, um, and we're going to be working very hard to make sure that that all of that information gets out there, that people know that, and that the, the Supreme Court is ready to make a fair and just decision. And we're very hopeful about that. Well, and that was going to be my next question. Um, you know, is this automatically going before the state Supreme Court then? Or is it, in, in, and then what happens if, um, well, either side, I would assume, would probably appeal. Who do they appeal to? Is it an appellate court here in the state? Do they have to appeal to the to the U.S. Supreme Court? Or who do they appeal to? Well, that, that's, that's quite a ways down the road. The Supreme Court has not actually, the state Supreme Court has not actually um, suggested or, or made any decisions about what they're going to do with the case. But it was filed as an original action to the Supreme Court. Um, it is up to them to decide whether or not they don't want to take the case, whether they take the case, or whether they kick the case back to a trial court. So until we know that, we won't know much about what, what the path looks like for the, for the challenge. Okay. So they could then, as you said, kick it back to a trial court. Mm -hmm. And would that be in Dane County? or? That is all up to the Supreme to, Court. It's yeah. hard to predict. They have they have uh, a wide array of options, and they're able to to decide what they feel is the best path. So, how long do they have to make a decision? Um, my understanding is they're not necessarily tied to a deadline. So, hmm. it's it's really up to them, and and 
what they feel about the case and what they decide to do with it. So this could go somewhat rapidly or it could move at snail's pace and slower? Right. <laughs> okay. Now, um, are they, they being the plaintiffs, are they trying to undo this so that any couple who has um, you know, gone through the registration process, paid their fee, which can range, I mean, it depends on the county, but it, it can run anywhere. I think I read on, maybe it was your site or maybe it was somewhere else, but it can run anywhere from like 60 or $70 up to like $115. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Um, so they want to undo what's been done, basically. Oh, well, yes, they, they, they would like to, but that's really up to the court again. Mm -hmm. um, every, everything rests with the court at this stage, hmm. with what they determine. Um, they, could, they could decide to not address the issue at all. They could decide to address the issue, but leave the current registrant standing, much like the California decision. Right, with the Proposition 8. Um, yeah. You know, it's, it's really up to how the court addresses it. So that's why it's going to be really important that we're ready and prepared to defend uh, and make sure that the legislation stands so that we don't have to address the question sure. of whether or not um, the people <laughs> who have registered get to remain registered. Well, and there's another question. Because you've, you know, every couple has paid a reasonable amount of money. They've basically mm -hmm. paid what the marriage license is going to cost mm -hmm. in that in that community. If they want to undo the partnership, they have to pay the same fee to mm -hmm. undo it. Um, so there's, there's a potential uh, of a lot of money that the state is ultimately getting. If this gets undone by some legislation, would the partners who have filed their domestic partnerships have grounds for a class action lawsuit? Oh, that's a good question. I, I do not know about what that would look like. Uh, It'd be a mess. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it would look like a huge mess. Well, let's just do everything we can to make sure we don't get to well, that I, point. I agree, but I'm always one, I'm one of these people, Katie, who likes to prepare for the very worst mm -hmm. in everything in life, and then I'm pleasantly surprised when it doesn't happen, <laughs> you know? But, but I, I was just thinking about that because, you know, I mean, yes, you're paying the money to the county uh, where you're registering, but ultimately the state's getting a chunk of that money, mm -hmm. and I would think that... I would think that there'd be grounds for a class action suit, but who knows. So let's, is there anything that we didn't, I mean, we could talk all night probably about this, but is there anything in particular that we haven't addressed that, that you think viewers should know about? Well, I think the one thing that I just want to highlight is that uh, sort of the, the scope of how big of a deal this piece of legislation is. Uh, because it's not just a set of protections. It's a really important step for our state. And it's an important step for these couples who have registered. And it's the first piece of positive legislation uh, for the lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender community in over 27 years. Since 1982. Yes since our state passed our non-discrimination acts that include sexual orientation. And Wisconsin was, the, as I'm sure you know, mm -hmm. was the first state to do oh, that. Oh, yes. So we've really, we've really put our state back on a progressive track, and we've really started to move in the right direction again. And so that's really exciting and really heartening. And it also puts Wisconsin on the map nationally because we've become the first state in the Midwest to legislatively enact any protections for same-sex couples, and also the first state with such a broad and expansive amendment that bans marriage, equality, and civil unions to do uh, a domestic partnership. So yeah. it's very exciting, um, and we're really looking forward to continuing to work on, on issues of equality and keep moving things forward. All right, excellent. Well, we've got, you know, uh, about five minutes left here, four and a half minutes, something like that. Um, can we just touch on some of the other things that, that Fair Wisconsin does? Um, because it's not just about this. You guys do a lot of other things. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, of course, it's all about equality and fairness. Sure. Um, and, and not special rights, just equal rights. Mm -hmm. But what other things are you guys involved in? Well, in addition to um, the legal challenge to domestic partnerships, we've also been working on the, uh, there's, there's a second case in front of the Supreme Court right now dealing with the constitutional amendment, and that is challenging how it was put to voters, that because it addresses both marriage equality and civil unions, something that many people feel um, are two different issues, uh, was put to the voters improperly. 
because we do have laws in our state that outline that a, a constitutional amendment can only address one issue. So the Supreme Court has accepted that case. So okay. we are going to be working on that case, making sure that um, the Supreme Court is able to make a fair and just decision in that case as well. Um, so that's that's also very exciting. Um, but uh, but that's that's our other legal challenge, and we're going to keep working with the legislature and working with the governor on other quality issues. Um, we've partnered with a group in Milwaukee to start building a statewide network of. Uh, group homes and shelters that deal with youth homeless, um, homeless youth. Uh, the LGBT community is overrepresented in the homeless youth population. About 20 to 40 percent of homeless youth identify as LGBT. And they're also the most vulnerable population as well. So we're working on some different administrative changes and advocacy work to try to get non-discrimination policies in group homes and shelters and also get some cultural competency training for those people who work with with um, homeless youth to make sure that that their trials and tribulations and, yeah. and problems with with the, uh, the the child welfare system are a little bit easier than they have been in the past. Okay, um, how did the so it, there, it's not just them who are homeless; it's their families who are homeless. Or is it just the kids who are homeless? In many cases, the, the, the change that we've seen in the population that identifies LGBT is that, that um, I think as kids are coming out younger and younger, they're running into more and more problems with their families. And so um, it's, not, it's not that they're becoming homeless with their family at a young age um, as much as it is that they're becoming homeless as they're coming out. So their parents are basically disowning them? Uh, in many times, or they're running into problems with their family that um, they didn't anticipate. And it's really unfortunate. Mm -hmm. and, and then they're in a system that's not necessarily set up to provide them the safest location and the safest service. OK. All right. Um, any other things that you guys are involved in? Well, we've got a, a long way to go uh, before we get to equality. So there are many other other projects that we have coming down the pipe, but those are some of the biggest ones. Okay. Right now. Like like, throw a couple out there. That, that's <laughs> that's coming. Is, or um, is it a state secret? Well, it's not a state <laughs> secret. Where you know, there's there's a lot of things that we need to do to make families safer in okay. Wisconsin. There's a lot of things that we need to do um, to work on issues around gender identity and expression, um, and we've got some some organizing to do within the transgender community to make sure that uh, you know we're building we're building towards revisiting that 1982 piece of legislation and getting gender identity and expression in there and okay. and I, I don't know how familiar you are with those issues or how familiar your viewers are um, but that's that's a very vulnerable group of people um, that really need to have some protection um, so that um, they're not discriminated against in, in terms of um, how they identify themselves. And that might be an even more uphill battle mm -hmm. just because Absolutely. they are a much more misunderstood segment of oh, our society. Oh, there's so much education work to do yeah. there. Um, so that's that's a very long-term project for us, but something that, that we really want to start um, tackling head on. Okay. All right. Excellent. Katie, thanks so much for being here tonight. Well, thank really you for having me. We really appreciate you driving down from, from Madison, driving up from Madison. It's been a long day. <laughs> <laughs> Driving up from Madison. Anyway, fairwisconsin.com is the website to go to if you want to learn more about domestic partnership um, and the laws there or just Fair Wisconsin as a whole. So thank you so much again. Thank you right, very much. Just sit much. tight. And that's going to do it for us. We'll see you next time. Until then, take good care. Keep your eye on us. We've got our eye on Oshkosh.